Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful place to uh, gather together. But Lord, more importantly, we thank you for your beautiful word. Mm -hmm. We thank you now uh, for this time to study it. We pray that you'd use Pastor Izzy, Lord, to speak to each one of us, to encourage us, to draw us ever closer to you. We ask that now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10? We're going to continue looking at the passage we began last week, the part of uh, Paul's Instructions to the church at Corinth is found in chapter 10 from verses 6 to verses uh, 13. We went over last week as an overview, and I said we'd come back to do a little bit more in-depth. And today's the fun part to me. This is the in-depth on a couple of the stories he alluded to, you know, because Paul, being the guy who was the founder of the church at Corinth on his second missionary journey, he, he planted the church there, and he stayed. He stayed and he pastored the work there for about a year and a half. Now, if you had Paul the Apostle for your founding pastor, how would that be? You know, you're like, you know, how, who was your founding pastor of your church? Oh, Paul the Apostle. Did he do anything for Jesus? Oh, just a few things, you know. Wrote like half the New Testament and uh, was used a little bit in the early church. Just a little, you know, to spread the gospel all around the whole, the whole region. And, uh, and... Because of this man, you know, he actually explains some of the things that it's not, um, not the way that men think. How he got qualified to do the job of an apostle. What was he doing that got him so qualified to be this great minister of the gospel, this proclaimer of the faith? What, 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 was, his, what was his entry level qualifications? What was his, you know, I mean, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, we know in the scripture. He studied under Gamaliel. He was a he was a zealous for the Jewish law. He says with a zeal, not any even his contemporaries couldn't keep up with this guy. He was so zealous. Except that was he zealous for um, Christianity? No, he was zealous to kill the Christians. In fact, he had a letter from the from the the chief priests that he was allowed to go and and any uh, anyone who belonged to this way, they called it the way, because Jesus is the way, the way, the truth, the life. That's what the early church was called, the way. So he says, anyone belonging to the way, he had the right to arrest them, have them beaten, humiliated in public. He would he'd imprison them. And all these things that he did was his intro to him getting saved. Because at one point he'll be on the road out there in the desert region and he'll be not to Damascus, to Emmaus. Wait, wait, which one is it? My wife always corrects me. So, uh, to, to Damascus. Sorry, sometimes I say Emmaus, and it's like Freudian slip, and it's the other one. So on his way to Damascus, he's going, and he gets blinded by a light brighter than the sun at high noon. And we know who the light was, because Jesus said, I am the light of the world, right? But Jesus appears to him, and Jesus appears and says, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth me? Now Jesus was, by the way, if you don't know the timeline, Jesus had already died on the cross. He had been buried. Three days later, he had rose again, shown himself alive by many convincing proofs over the next 40 days before he's finally taken up right before the apostles into heaven. The skies parted and they got to see Jesus. Anyone would like to see that one on the big screen? Or if we had a time machine, who would go with me back on that day to see heaven open right above you and see Jesus just lift from the earth and go, whoop. You know, like, I mean, this is like, what, sci-fi kind of thing. But this is in the Bible. The Bible's better than sci-fi. I mean, it's got it all. And here he goes up in the heaven. Now, this is, this would, how many questions would this answer? I mean, seriously, we think of heaven as so far away, but is it really? Or is it just hidden from our perception? You know, are angels really far away or are they just all around us? It's just that our, our, our perception, we don't see them. But they're right there. They're, they're there and, and all around looking after us. And here, they got to see the perception. I, I call it like the big screen. You know, like say you're watching a movie and 
the movie's being projected onto that flat image. That's only 2D. I mean, it might look like 3D to your eyes, but it's, it's just an image on a flat screen. If you tore the screen open and had a guy behind the screen, like Jesus, step through, says, here I am. By the way, in the book of Revelations, it says, when he returns again, the sky will, will rent asunder. It was going to just, like a curtain, whoosh, tear open. And his coming will be in the clouds. So we have a really good chance today. A lot of clouds out there. This would be one of the days when, when Wally Dolan used to live here, he'd be like, oh, you're worried about the rain in a couple hours? No, I'm not. Jesus could come. This is a good day. You know, every time it was cloudy, he'd be like, it says his coming will be in the clouds. All we need is the, right? Just like, whoosh, tear open and out pops the Lord. And what we see as this 3D reality, there is a greater reality beyond it of the spiritual realm. And it's just like that 2D screen tearing and a physical 3D person stepping through it. You'd say, oh, wow, it's not the movie on the screen. There's actually something behind it. Someday we're going to feel the same way when we see Christ reappear. Now, Paul, Paul is out killing Christians and persecuting them and arresting them. And he has this beautiful experience of Jesus showing up. And it says it blinded him. It was brighter than the sun at high noon. That's how bright Jesus' presence was. And Jesus said, why, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecuteth me? Now, Jesus, Jesus is up in heaven. It says he took his seat right at the right hand of the Father. And yet he comes from that seat and he says, why are you picking? And he was, he was picking on the church, which gives me great comfort. Jesus has got to be a little bit Italian. I, no, he's not. He's Jewish. But the <laughs> only reason I say that is because the way I was brought up in my Sicilian upbringing, if you pick on someone in my family, you pick a fight with my whole family. I mean, and I mean my whole family will come to the rescue of just, you know, one. And my dad drilled it into me. If any, I'm the oldest in our family of six. If anyone picks on your little brothers or sisters, it's your job to defend their honor. You know, anyone causes any trouble, you step up and take care of them. You're the, when I'm not there, you're the man in my place. That, my dad would tell me stuff like this. One day some guy picked on my sister in the playground, and my dad told me what to do. And I went over and did it, and I got drugged to the principal's office. <laughs> and then my dad, he, he said to put me on the line, and he asked me in Italian, he told me, speak only in Italian, tell me what happened. And I told him that, this guy in the playground was touching my sister on the, on the breast and, you know, laughing about it. I told him, don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. And then he continued, and I just went over and did what you said. And my dad taught me some martial arts moves, and I did one, two. And by the time I got to the, ready to do three, he was on the ground, crumpled up. And I was like, wow, that works really good. <laughs> they drugged me by the ear. Back then, they used to be allowed to do that. They get you right here, come to the principal's office, and they take me in there, and I, I thought, I'm dead. I was the good kid. Now I'm in trouble. And they took that kid, and, they, and I told them what my dad, what they did, and they said, my dad said, hand the phone back to the principal. So I hand it back. I never hear my dad raise his voice. I could hear my dad yelling through the phone, and I'm just on the other side of the desk saying, if you do anything about my son, I'll be down there myself. And that other boy better get in trouble because he touched my daughter on the, on the breast and that's not allowed and what kind of school is this? And, and he let him have it. Next thing I know, the gut principal goes, you can go back to class. And the other boy got expelled. That's what they used to do back then, you know. And, uh, and so I was taught this. And Jesus, when I read the Bible and I saw Jesus took issue with Saul... By the way, Paul's name used to be Saul. Jesus is going to change it, right? And this, this encounter is when he gets his name changed from Saul to Paul. But while he's Saul persecuting the Christians, Jesus says, why dost thou persecuteth me? In other words, you're picking on my bride, the bride of Christ, right? We're his bride. You're picking on my bride, my family. You pick on them, you pick on who? On me. And so he blinded him. And Saul was quick to come back. He went, who art thou, Lord? 
that I might serve thee. So that, that's what I call a real quick comeback. You know, he's blind, but he's like, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. And for the next three days, we know that Saul was given the most intense seminary experience there was. Jesus told him all that Saul was now going to suffer for his namesake. And not only that, he said, Saul, you're too full of yourself. Because Saul in Hebrew means like GQ for men. It's desirable, handsome, you know, good looking. If you call someone Saul, that's like a, a real nice compliment. That's your, you know, hot stuff as a guy kind of thing. And Jesus went, no longer we're going to call you that. We're going to call you Paul. Paul in Hebrew means little. Little one. You know, like you're so full of yourself. Oh, I'm so hot. I'm so big. I'm so good. He goes, eh, let's change that. We can call you little one. Wow. <laughs> big demotion here <laughs> from Saul to Paul. But Paul is writing to the church that he got to share the gospel with. And he got to pastor. And he was used mightily by the Lord. But when, when you ask him, what's your qualifications? He goes, you know, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to what? Confound the wise. You want to know I got this job? I'm a fool. <laughs> you know, sometimes people say, how did you get the job, Pastor? Uh, I think it's the same thing Paul used. I'm pretty sure because you've got to be a fool to do this. I mean, this is a crazy job. You're constantly under just scrutiny by everyone. You're attacked over the silliest of things. I mean, people, you find out how petty. If you don't know how petty people are, you should become a pastor for just a day. You only need one day. Trust me, you don't need longer than that. Don't do it for more than a day. By the end of the day, you'll be like, they're really petty. And you'll be going, how can you do this day after day? Well, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because Paul actually alludes to some of the stories in the Old Testament where the children of Israel showed their pettiness towards God's choice of leaders. And they happen to be the very examples we read over last week. I didn't have time to take you to the story to show you some of the pettiness and some of the little subtleties that the leaders had to go through. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.